the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Collect and the Readings for the Twelfth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, for giving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The New Testament reading is taken from St Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honour, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reader and preacher this Sunday is the Reverend Ruth Bull. according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Lord, take my words and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. Last week, in our Gospel reading, which comes immediately before today's, when Jesus asked Simon Peter who he said Jesus was, he declared, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus blessed him for this and announced that he would now be known as Peter, meaning rock, and that on this rock he would build his church. Also, Peter would hold the keys of heaven. What greater accolade could he have been given? But in today's reading, only moments later, things have changed radically and Jesus calls Peter Satan, probably the strongest rebuke that Jesus uses anywhere in the Gospels. So what has changed and what has happened to bring this about? I have a great affection for the Apostle Peter. He has one of the strongest personalities of all the Apostles and it comes through many times in the Gospels. He's enthusiastic and devoted, but often rushes in without really thinking things through. He has his faults, but they are outweighed by his faith. And though, as we see in this episode, it is a faith that is not yet deeply developed. He understands some things, but he does not understand fully, which I think can be a comfort to us all. So what happened to bring about this rebuke from Jesus? Jesus had been preaching, teaching and healing and had drawn a large crowd of followers. But now he began to prepare his closest friends for what was to come. He began to tell them that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter heard this. And this was not at all what he expected from the Messiah, the one who would come to save them all from the oppressors. He expected him to go to Jerusalem, yes, but presumably to overthrow the Romans and restore justice and peace to the earth. What he heard about the coming death of Jesus was not at all the plan in his mind. He may not have listened to the last part about being raised on the third day, or if he heard it, he failed to understand what this meant. No doubt, buoyed up by the accolades on him, bestowed on him by Jesus a short while before, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, it says. Here, Peter seems to have changed roles with Jesus and was now acting as the leader or teacher. He declared that this must not happen. And this brings about the harsh rebuke from Jesus. Get me, get behind me, Satan. Having just told Peter he was the rock on which he would build the church, that rock has now become a stumbling block. There are echoes of Jesus' temptations in the wilderness at the start of his ministry. Peter unwittingly was tempting Jesus to abandon the hard road that the Father had given him to travel, exactly as he had been tempted in the wilderness. Jesus knew that he must be crucified and rise again, much as he might well have preferred to avoid this. It was the divine plan for the salvation of all. He showed this when he told Peter that he had set his mind not on divine things, but on human things. How often have we all been guilty of that? Jesus went on to explain what it means to be a true follower of Christ, saying, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. To his followers, this would have been a very stark statement, as the cross would not have had all the religious symbolism that it does for Christians today, but would have been clearly a statement that following Jesus could well involve suffering and even death for those first faithful followers. But that call to take up your cross and follow Jesus is a call that has resounded through the ages and is one that has been taken up by so many Christians over the centuries. And that cry goes out today, 
but as just as much as in the past. But it is not a call to arms, as it might sound, but a call to sacrifice. Last week, Rector Simon spoke about sacrifice in his sermon and talked about it being not so much about a single act or event as a continuing process. It is an offering of our whole lives that is constantly developing alongside our faith. Tom Wright, in his book Matthew for Everyone, writes about committing ourselves to following Christ and he writes, Following him will cost everything and give everything. There are no half measures on this journey. It's going to be like learning to swim. If you keep your foot on the bottom of the pool, you'll never work out how to do it. You have to lose your life to find it. What's the use of keeping your feet on the bottom when the water gets too deep? You have the choice, swim or drown. Apparent safety walking on the bottom isn't an option any longer. I don't know about you, but I can still remember as a child pretending to swim and keeping one foot on the bottom of the swimming pool just in case. So I really like that image because faith is indeed a bit like learning to swim. Do we risk taking our feet off and trusting we can swim or do we hang on to where we have been, dipping our toes in but not fully immersing ourselves in our faith? just in case we don't like the idea of being challenged and missing out on some of the superficial pleasures of our earthly life. At some point, we need to make that leap of faith and really put our trust in God and look beyond the earthly to the heavenly. So how do we take up our cross and follow Christ? Our first reading today from Paul's letter to the Romans gives us some very clear instructions on this subject. It might at first seem to be a fairly simple list of things to do, but if we look more closely, they are really challenging and will involve our whole selves and our whole lives. I do hope that after this service, you will look again at the reading from the letter to the Romans in more detail. I could spend another hour or more exploring this passage, but I'm just going to take one idea from this reading, and that is about being genuine or sincere. It begins with the words, let love be genuine. It is about love coming from the heart. So much in our society today is about what things look like. Appearances, having the right facade or veneer on your life rather than getting the fundamentals right. What is important, we are being told, is not to be hypocritical, but to act sincerely and genuinely. So love being genuine is about not just smiling, being polite and then moving on without it coming from the heart. It is rather about following Christ's example and living a life of genuine love. There will always be people we warm to more than others, but everyone is made in the image of God. People may do things we don't like or which we know to be wrong, but there is still good in each person and that deserves our love. That in itself is a sacrificial challenge, to live our lives in that way, and it will not be easy. But imagine the world if we could all manage to do that. Perhaps then the world of justice and peace that Peter and others expected the Messiah to bring about would be that little bit closer. Amen. We are the body of Christ. By the one Spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And we end with the blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.